Thank you, Rodrigo, for reminding me. We should record tonight. Um, I am, again, so pleased by tonight's attendance, and I appreciate you taking the time to learn more about this historic piece of legislation with me and my colleagues. Um, with me tonight, I have Rodrigo Heng Leighton, NCT East Executive Director. Uh, for many of you, the last time you may have joined an NCTE webinar, Rodrigo was joined by our outgoing Executive Director, Mara Kiesling. Uh, Rodrigo has now been at the helm of NCTE for 100 days, he actually marked his 100th day last Friday, and he is so excited to share with you what we've accomplished in his first three months um, as Executive Director. Also joining me tonight is Ames Simmons, NCTE's Policy Director, and Sebastian Ursai Smith, NCTE's National Organizer. Both Ames and Sai have been essential members of the team as NCT has mounted a collective campaign to pass the Equality Act. Um, the Equality Act has a complex history, um, which we're going to dive into a bit later with Ames. Uh, but now, uh, with allies in Congress and the White House, we are closer than ever to getting the Equality Act passed into law. Um, if passed, the Equality Act would amend the 1964 Civil Rights Act to explicitly prevent discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. This act would explicitly enshrine those non-discrimination protections into law and apply them to several areas of life, including covering places long left out of legislation, like areas of public accommodation, such as retail stores and transportation services. Um, the journey here has been really difficult, but we are proud to see where our hard work has led us. Um, tonight, our panelists are gonna explain in depth what the Equality Act means for our community, in particular, what protections can we anticipate and what work will still need to be done after this passage? How will implementation work? And what about exemptions? Most of the questions we will respond to tonight come from your pre-submitted questions. So thank you so much for sending those in um, early on as we prepared for tonight's webinar. Um, before we begin, I will note that this webinar is closed to the media. If you are a member of the press um, and wish to discuss the Equality Act further with an NCTE staff member, um, you may contact us at press at transequality.org. Um, now I'm going to pass it off to Rodrigo, who's going to give us a little retrospective on his first 100 days as ED. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Sean, and thank all of you for joining us tonight. Welcome to our fall community webinar. Before we get into the main topic of tonight's webinar, I'd like to begin with a couple updates from NCTE. The first is the U.S. Transgender Survey, the USTS. You probably are all really familiar with it, but just in case, the U.S. Transgender Survey is the largest and most comprehensive study of transgender people's experiences. In many cases, it is literally our only way of measuring the discrimination that transgender people face every day. So it is absolutely essential. I mean, after all, you can't solve a problem if you can't even prove that it exists. So we see advocates use the U.S. Transgender Survey, not just here at NCTE, but all around the country, literally every single day. So where does it stand? Well, the last time we fielded the survey, uh, meaning, well, we field the survey every five years. That means every five years, we actually put it out in the world for people to complete the survey. We were going to do this in 2020, last year. But as you may remember, 2020 was an unusual time. <laughs> we were hit with COVID right in the middle of all of it. So like many organizations, we had to pivot. The good news is that now we're on track to field it in February. So in just a few short months, it'll be out in the field, ready for everybody to complete it. We will absolutely be circling back to all of you if you are trans for you to complete the survey. If you know people who are trans, which I bet you do because you're on this webinar, uh, for you to get your, get your friends and family to take it. So who do we hope to reach with the survey? Well, thousands upon thousands of transgender people. If you live in the United States and you're trans, we want you to fill this out. And that actually goes, by the way, for the territories as well. This isn't even just all 50 states. This is also places like Puerto Rico and even the Northern Mariana Islands. Believe it or not, we are actually helping Northern Mariana Islands pass their own version of the Equality Act as a territory. But that's a story for another day, another webinar. Uh, we are, uh, on top of that, though, doing really targeted outreach to parts of our trans community who are often left out of research like this. We have targeted outreach strategies to reach Black trans people, Latino trans people, other trans people of color, 
trans people in rural areas, veterans, Spanish speakers. We want every single trans person who is willing to take the survey to have the opportunity to do so. And Sai, who's here tonight, is a big part of that outreach. One of the really exciting things about doing the survey in February is that we're gonna have an opportunity to ask questions about COVID. We all know that trans people have been especially hurt by the pandemic, whether it's because we often lack access to healthcare, so we get sick first and have a hard time accessing treatment for it, or because we tend to work low-wage jobs that were the first to get laid off when the economic shutdowns happen. But there's actually very, very little information about the effect of COVID on trans people. It's not actually part of most federal studies or other healthcare research that is out there. So now we're gonna have the first time ever opportunity to actually get some data about the effect of this pandemic on transgender people. So we'll be fielding this in February and I'm really excited to announce that that means we'll be able to publish the final report by the end of the year. So by this time next year, by the end of 2022, we'll have this full information for advocates to be able to start using on the ground in their policy advocacy right away. So the second update I wanted to give is about, <laughs> hey Luna, that's Ames's cat, who is a frequent guest at our staff meetings. Why should this webinar be any different? <laughs> our honorary staffer. Uh, so the update, other update I wanted to give is about our, my, I was gonna say our, it is kind of our, but my first hundred days as executive director, like Sean mentioned. We've had been able to have so many opportunities in just this short time. When it comes to policy change, We've been working, we secured an entire victory on passports out of the State Department and are now really closely working closely with the State Department to make it real. Um, you may, for those of you who aren't familiar, the passports are not actually just for travel. And for many transgender people, that is the only accurate document we can get. If you live in a state that still has archaic rules around driver's licenses or birth certificates, the passport is the document that you can get that has your real photo, your real name, and your authentic gender on it. And that is essential for doing basic things like applying for an apartment or enrolling in a new job or school. So we were able to secure a victory on passports where now it's going to be much easier to update the gender on your passport. And we'll also be able to use the X gender marker option as well. This was announced a little bit ago, but you know, we're also, the journey is not over. We're working really closely with the State Department to make sure that they roll it out and they roll it out in a sensitive way that is accessible to all trans people. We also scored a victory out of the Veterans Administration. Uh, and the Veterans Administration was one of the last places that still had an explicit ban on transition-related surgery. They covered hormones, but they would not cover surgery. And there are so many transgender veterans who rely on the VA for healthcare every day. And there is no reason that they should be denied this opportunity that we all know, and even the American Medical Association knows is essential healthcare. We were able to score a victory after years and years and years, literally over a decade of working on the VA, we were able to finally win that now the VA is going to cover transition-related surgeries. Like with anything else though, we're not at the end of the road. We're working really closely with the VA to make sure that they handle this right, that they get all the sensitivity training and cultural competency that they need, and that they're ready to roll this out at all their VA health centers with everything from the data processing to the clinical support. And then lastly, we got the Biden administration to speak out against the state attacks on transgender youth. I don't have to tell you that this last legislative session, trans youth were being attacked in state after state after state after state. And we got the Biden administration to speak up against this and to speak directly to trans youth and say, we've got your back. So now where does NCT go from here? My vision is for us to absolutely continue this incredible policy work and supplement it with organizing and voting. We want NCT to be the kind of organization 
that you don't just witness from far away, but an organization that you can join, that you can participate in, that you can be part of. And that, so that is going to involve a lot of partnering with community organizations, partnering widely throughout the country with local and state level trans organizations that maybe we haven't reached out with much before and collaborating to make sure that we mobilize trans and allied people all around the nation. We've been coupling that with an internal transformation to make NCT the best possible place to work. We've expanded professional development opportunities, created salary bans for pay equity, overhauled our structures to increase everyone's opportunities to engage. We're making changes every single day. We have an incredible team, an amazing staff, some of whom you see here tonight. And now we're working together to do a ton more outreach so that everyone can meet the new NCTE and that NCTE is not just our organization, but it's your organization too. So as you can see, we've got a lot going on here. <laughs> All of this incredible work is possible in part because of your support. So thank you so much for investing in this. To now, to begin our discussion of the main topic, I'll pass it over to Ames, who will kick us off with some history on the Equality Act, from where it all started actually decades ago to where we're at now. Ames, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Rigo, um, for setting the stage. Um, like you said, it has been uh, a long <laughs> and winding path indeed of trying to get non-discrimination protections for transgender and non-binary people. But through this entire fight, um, the trans community has been part of, an integral part, really, of the shaping of the Equality Act. Um, even before I came to NCTE, um, for many years before me, um, there were uh, staff from NCTE who were on the drafting committee of the Equality Act. Um, and that's important because representation matters. Um, it's important to have trans people who are in the room when the language is being drafted. Um, and uh, trans people have not always been uh, the priority in the Equality Act, so it's really meaningful to have um, multiple trans people who were involved in the drafting of it now. Um, to just go back to like some really ancient history, the Equality Act, um, was actually the name of a bill that was introduced in 1974 by Representative Bella Absug. And I know that is 47 years ago because uh, my younger brother was born in 1974. Um, so it was actually called the Equality Act back then. And the legislation has been reintroduced in almost every single Congress since then over those, um, over these past 47 years. Um, the employ so it was the it began to um, take the shape of employment protections. So it was um, that legislation was renamed the Employment Non Discrimination Act, and uh, as many people in the trans community know, um, when I first like began to understand my transness in two thousand um, eight and nine, um, Enda was. Uh, uh, something that trans people everywhere were talking about, the need for employment protections. Um, there, based on some political calculations that had to do with um, the Democrats recapturing Congress in 2007, um, gender identity um, for that Congress was stripped out of the bill. Many of you may have been present for that. It was a um, painful moment in the community. Um, but from that, um, the Equality Act began to take place, which is um, a much broader bill. So the objective of the Equality Act um, is to cover more kinds of discrimination than just employment. So it adds housing, education, credit, jury service even, um, to, uh, among other things, um, to the Civil Rights Act. So. Um, <laughs> The Equality Act in the form that it's in now, more or less, uh, was introduced in 2015. And um, it's been, it did pass the House in 2019, and it did pass the House again this year in 2021. 
Um, but I'm if and I, I'm sure that you all are probably aware that Congress itself is a challenging environment right now, uh, particularly um, the Senate. So because of a procedural rule that is called the filibuster that requires 60 yes votes, um, that means we would essentially need every Democrat in the Senate and plus some Republicans. Um, and we are we feel confident that we will be able to get the Equality Act passed, but we're still working on getting to 60. So it's uh, still very much in play. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ames, for providing that history for us. Um, and it really has been such a complex uh, journey, but we are we are here today and we've made it <laughs> almost. Um, so I'm going to uh, pass it off to Rodrigo. We're going to just have an open dialogue here. I want to keep it casual, but really just have this conversation where we can talk about um, the Equality Act and its importance. Um, so yeah, why is the Equality Act important, Rodrigo? I mean, uh, we know it covers non-discrimination, but what does that really mean? Yeah, it's a great question because that, that can sound like some kind of abstract legal concept. But most basically, the reason that the Equality Act is so important is because it will extend these protections to all these other parts of our daily life. You know, when we talk with folks in the public and when you do polling, we find that a lot of people assume that we already have something like this. A lot of people assume that it's already illegal to kick someone out of a store for being trans or to kick someone out of a park um, for being trans or for being in a same-sex relationship or something like that. But the truth is that there's actually no federal law to put that in explicit black and white terms. Now, there are some state level laws and NCT has been a part for years and years in securing these state level protections. So the good news is that we do have these protections in roughly half the country, but the bad news is that we don't have them in roughly half the country. And I think we can all agree that your civil rights should not depend on your zip code. So we need the Equality Act to make sure that all of us are protected from discrimination, no matter where we live. And the other thing that I think people often don't realize about the Equality Act is that, you know, sure, we, we normally talk about it as being an LGBTQ issue, and it absolutely is. But it is also a racial justice issue. But there's the, the famous Civil Rights Act of 1964 and many other years that made it so that it is illegal under federal law to discriminate on the basis of race. But that was passed decades ago, and our lives and our society has changed a lot since then. Legislation that was, that was designed and crafted in the 1960s does not capture every facet of our lives today. For example, we all know that it is illegal to kick someone off of a bus for being black or for being any race. But what you may not realize is that there's no federal law that covers you from being kicked out of an Uber or a Lyft ride because buses were the only form of dominant transportation like that at that time. But times have changed. So there are a lot of gaps right now. You know, I'm, I happen to be Cuban American and I, I'm trans, I'm also gay and I'm married to a man. Right now, if I was in a store or in an Uber, someone could try to kick me out because they heard me speaking Spanish or because they realized that the man sitting next to me was my husband. The Equality Act would fix this. It would make it clear that discrimination is not okay under the law. That is why it's so important. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rico, for that overview. Um, and, you know, one thing that um, Ames kind of touched on earlier was uh, really since 1974, um, the Equality Act and then and, uh, now the Equality Act again has been a bit of a political battlefield. Um, we've seen this almost a controversy over securing rights just for um, existing as an LGBTQ person in society. Um, so I want to know, Ames, why is it so polarizing? Why do people uh, debate on this issue? So I think this is, I almost want to push back on the idea that the Equality Act is polarizing. Like it's polarizing because people who oppose it 
um, have made it into um, something that it is not. Um, so like y'all might have seen earlier this year when Representative Marie Newman um, hung a trans flag outside of her office. Um, she has a trans child and Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who um, is uh, from my home state of Georgia, um, put up uh, another sign that was basically saying the science says that uh, there are only two genders. Um, there are often religious objections that are woven into that in an attempt to drive a wedge between the religious uh, or faith community and trans and non-binary people, which of course is like a, a false wedge because we know that there are trans and non-binary people who are also people of faith. Um, so um, there's a lot of noise that is around that, but I also just wanted to highlight something that Rigo said that a little bit we ha are having to convince our own community that the Equality Act is still needed um, for folks who are LGBTQ, um, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer parts of our community. Um, a lot of people after marriage equality thought like, uh, well, we're, our work is done. Uh, and even uh, after the Bostock Supreme Court decision last June, a lot of people thought, oh, well, uh, discrimination is illegal now, so we don't need an act. Um, and that's just not not true for many reasons. Um, it, given the Supreme Court that we have, it would be very helpful for Congress to explicitly state that uh, discrimination is prohibited on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And also the Equality Act, like we were talking about earlier, is so much broader. Um, it's important that those protections from that Supreme Court case that the Biden administration is um, interpreting that uh, court case to apply to other areas, but we really need for it to be explicit in the law. Great, thank you so much. Um, now I wanna jump to uh, some specific questions that we got prior to tonight um, and, and really just touching on some of the questions that you submitted um, as attendees before um, um, jumping on tonight. So the first question we received um, really, uh, uh, addresses older trans people. Um, and Rodrigo, I think this would be a great question for you. So um, we were asked, how does the Equality Act protect older trans people? Um, are there any advantages over existing legislation? Yeah, this is a really good question. Thank you to whoever in the audience who asked that great one. Um, so older trans people are already protected from discrimination on the basis of age and age only under existing federal laws, um, especially the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and in the Fair Housing Act. But the Equality Act would provide additional explicit protections against discrimination based on gender identity. So there are already some protections, but there are also these gaps and the Equality Act would, would plug those holes and would fill those gaps. Great, thanks so much. Um, and another thing that we, we hear a lot about is, is non-discrimination protections in healthcare. Um, and never has that been uh, more important than really in the past 18 months when we've been dealing with this once in a century pandemic and what it's done uh, to our community and how it's affected us. Um, so I'd really love to know, Ames, what is the Equality Act's impact on non-discrimination protections um, in insurance and Medicaid? So it is hard to give a simple answer to this question that is still technically right in every aspect. <laughs> um, but what I will say is that uh, the advocacy community has been clear for years now that um, trans people are already protected from uh, sex discrimination in healthcare under a different law, the section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, which um, was uh, President Obama's flagship legislation. Um, it is true that the Equality Act would add um, discrimination protections against discrimination in federal funding. So that would affect healthcare providers who participate in the Medicaid uh, program because they're pulling down federal dollars for giving that care. Um, and I, I think 
uh, if we're thinking about healthcare uh, in a bigger sense than just how it's paid for, um, uh, in many respects, a hospital or a physician office that opens its door to the public would also um, be covered under the Equality Act as a place of public accommodation or a place where um, the public goes to get services. It's very helpful, thank you. Um, and then another question we got uh, uh, revolved around hate crime protections. And I know we think non-discrimination, we also tie that back to protecting our community, especially against violence. Um, so Rodrigo, what is the relationship between the Equality Act and any existing or potentially future hate crime protections? Yeah, this is a really important topic, especially considering that attacks against transgender people seem to be rising. I see same too because there's a lack of data out there, right? That's the whole reason that we field the US transgender survey. But even from the data that we can gather, it is really clear that transgender people, especially black transgender women are being quite frankly murdered at alarming rates that only seems to grow. And that even is growing recently outpacing the general increase in homicides that sadly has already happened during the pandemic. So there is a backlash of as much progress as we're making trans rights. There is also a backlash. And some of us are bearing the brunt of that backlash much more than others and in just heartbreaking, irrevocable ways. So this is any questions about violence are really critical. Now, the Equality Act doesn't directly affect federal hate crimes laws. There's um, laws, especially the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act though that would still stand, um, but federal protections from discrimination will help address the anti-trans environment that fuels this violence in the first place. The Equality Act is critical to creating a safer environment and creating a society where trans people can get housing, can get jobs, and can safely navigate public life without so many threats. That is critical for preventing these kinds of attacks in the first place. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, now I'm going to pass it off to Cy, who's been sitting oh so patiently waiting for his turn. Uh, so thanks, Cy. Um, now that we've learned about uh, the Equality Act, uh, sort of the basics, the fundamentals, um, and its importance, um, and sort of what some of the things it's going to cover. I imagine there are some folks in the audience tonight who, um, you know, um, really want to look into like what they could do uh, to uh, support the Equality Act uh, in public life, um, in their personal life, um, and, and how we can as a collective um, work towards supreme victory. Thank you, Sean. And I have been so patient, but I've learned a lot to myself tonight. So that's what we can do, though. That's kind of leading right to my point, you know, is we can educate ourselves. We can first know exactly everything Angel and um, Rodrigo shared with us tonight about the Equality Act. Understand what it means. Understand what happens when it's implemented. Understand what it covers and all of those broad things that it'll cover just so we know how it affects our own lives. And then once we're educated about what it means, I think that in itself empowers us to then start making action. Let me find out who my senators are. Let's be honest, some people may not know who their senators are at all. So find out who your senators are. Find out, you know, some of the things, some of the legislation they've passed before and, and if they support the Equality Act. I'm here in Georgia. My senators support the Equality Act, but when I make that phone call to them, which is what I'm going to tell you all to do as well, when you start calling your senators, there's something that we can do. What I tell them is to tell their colleagues to get on the same boat as them and get on the same idea and the same pages as them. If, even if you're in the state and you know your senators actually support the Equality Act. And then, of course, you know what to do if your senators don't. Bring some humanistic part to those messages. Call them and let them know your experiences with discrimination, if, especially if you're an uh, LGBTQ plus identified person. You know, as Rodrigo um, just hinted to or just talked about the violence that our community faces, I'm sure all of us know someone, someone's trans or non-binary who has who's been taken from us and quite frankly murdered. We're experiencing that now with the community in Mississippi where a Black trans man has been murdered. You know, and 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 we're, we can, once the Equality Act is, is passed, we can be protected in public spaces like hospitals, 
So they do their due diligence to find out who we are instead of misgendering us in paperwork and in the media and with, and with police authorities. So again, one of my biggest points is definitely to educate yourself. And once you educate yourself, find out ways to volunteer, phone banking, text banking. There's so many of those opportunities out there. I know it sounds intimidating and I'm sure I've probably texted a few of y'all before, but I swear it's fun. I, it is fun, especially because we're only calling and texting supporters. So it's good to talk to, to people who support and they may have questions as well. You know, so just any find any opportunity to volunteer and help out. Fabulous. Thanks so much. And, um, we got a really great question um, before tonight's webinar, um, really focusing on how we uh, connect maybe with the people who aren't as supportive of the Equality Act, or maybe in many ways just don't know enough about the Equality Act um, to throw their support behind it. And so um, I'm curious to know how, you know, we have phone banking, we have text banking, we have um, tools in our tool belt, but um, how do we reach parts of the country or um, certain communities that are particularly conservative maybe, um, or very religious? Um, and, and how do we tell them that the Equality Act helps them too? We make it relatable, Sean. We make it relatable. We make it, we break it down to whoever I'm having the conversation with. If I'm having the conversation with a Black trans person, then I break it down and make it relatable to this is how you're going to be protected under the Equality Act. If I'm talking to an older American who may not, who's a non-trans person, let me tell you that you're protected under some federal protections according to your age, you know, however, here are some places that there are some gaps, like the ones that Rigo talked about. You know, and then make this this palatable, make it understandable to people in human everyday language, for the lack of a better term. Because I think we're advocates, we're people that do this work every day. So we talk in a way that we understand. But does the general public understand that? Do the, do the constituents who we're asking to call our senators understand the language that we're talking? So you have to tailor your language, tailor your message, tailor your delivery to the audience in which you're speaking to and making that information relatable and palatable, palatable and understandable. And then realize we're all different too, right? Not everybody's going to be swayed and that's okay. We're going to have opposition. That's, that's a part of life. And I, I, when I approach conversations like these that are so sensitive in some, in some areas, I go in saying that I'm not here to change your mind, but I'm here to give you a view or another way or another aspect to look at or another a group of people who are living this existence, regardless if you believe in it or not. We're living this experience and living this existence, you know? So just going in with knowing that you're not gonna change everybody's mind, but what you can do is give them something else to look at, something else to think about. Awesome, thank you so much, that's great. Um, and I'm actually gonna pass it on to Ames now um, because we, We've been seeing in the media a lot, um, on social media and then in broadcast and print media, um, maybe what an uphill battle it has been. And, and over the years, all the, the work that's gone in and, and some of the challenges we've faced. Um, so I think a lot of people on the call tonight, because you know we, there was an expectation that maybe there would have been a vote before tonight's webinar, there hasn't been. Um, so will this really be vote? timeline look like? It seems like this is taking forever. Well, it's so Congress is messy. Um, it, you know, that old saying about um, how laws are made, it takes, it takes Congress a while to get used to policy language um, and to talk to, you know, Congress people like to talk to their constituents and find out where the pain points are and, and try to um, talk to advocates about, um, you know, what the bill would actually do in real life. Um, so, you know, they, Congress has been a little uh, preoccupied, at the Senate for sure, has been with um, trying to get things like the debt ceiling and uh, funding the government and um, the infrastructure bill, Build Back America, um, or Build Back Better, all of those things. Um, so, the, yes, there are a lot of variables that are constantly moving as far as when the Senate might um, take a vote on this. Um, even if uh, it doesn't happen this year, um, it could very well happen next year. Congress um, runs for two-year terms. 
Um, but we, we know that um, we wanna take a vote when the support is there. The Equality Act has the best chance um, if we build the support before a vote is taken. So it's important to be doing that work, um, that prep work, which we are actively doing. Great, thanks so much. Um, so let's, let's say a vote has happened and the Equality Act has passed. Um, after we've poured the champagne and taken down the streamers, um, what happens, Sai? Uh, how is this implemented? I mean, it's a big bill, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So our federal agencies, you know, they will start to <clears throat> update their procedures and forms and able uh, transgender people to large complaints of discrimination. So that's when we get our real policy change. That's when we get all of this stuff in the books. This is when we get the policy changes and allow a pathway for trans and non-binary folks to make, to file complaints about discrimination and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully steer some folks away from even having these situations at all because they know we have these type of, these type of protections in place. Great. Um, and, and, you know, it passes, right? And this is awesome, but um, we know there are some states in this country that um, don't know when to leave the ring. And so the question is, um, what happens if there's some resistance? Um, and it, are there legal challenges that we need to brace for? Um, James, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so the um, kind of administrative law in a nutshell that I will tell you is that generally federal laws take precedence over state laws that are to the contrary, unless the state laws are more protective of people's rights. And there are some states where that's the case. Um, places where I've been spending time, like Georgia and North Carolina, um, those are states that do not have um, state level protections that um, where the Equality Act is especially important. It is always possible that uh, a state could um, bring a, a legal challenge to the Equality Act. Like if we were gonna take bets, I would guess that it would be Texas because they've already sued the federal government over so many, like recently the Affordable Care Act was uh, once again in front of the Supreme Court because Texas sued the government. So I wouldn't, you know, we can't rule things like that out, but it's also, um, you know, we would be able to meet that challenge. I think if um, it, it's not a reason to, you know, worry about the, the fate of the Equality Act. No, um, and you know, with, like with everything, we have to consider the alternative, right? Um, so what if the Equality Act doesn't pass, uh, Rodrigo? What, where do we go from here? Um, what, what, what's next? If the Equality Act does pass, we keep fighting. You know, there is no rule against reintroducing the bill. And this is really, really important to know. This is not like, let's say, a presidential election where there's one election, there's one vote, and if the person loses, that's that. The Quality Act functions really differently. There's actually no limit on how many times we can reintroduce a bill. Um, so if the Quality Act does get a vote in the Senate and we lose, we come back around the next Congress. Like Aim said, there's two-year sessions, and we keep doing this. We have the power to get this bill passed. What it is not if it will pass, it is a matter of when. Now, we need the Equality Act like yesterday because people's rights are on the line. So that is why we have this urgency to flood senators' offices with phone calls right now. But we absolutely are going to pass this thing because the wind is at our backs as a transgender rights movement we have been achieving victories in the last few years that nobody thought was possible. When I came out as trans about 10 years ago, maybe it's more than that, I gotta do some math. But, but at that time, it would have been inconceivable to think about being able to update all of your identity documents and, and accurately have my name Rodrigo and the letter M for male on all my materials. It would have been inconceivable to work a full-time job on transgender rights, for this to be what all four of us on this webinar speaking do for a living. It would have been inconceivable to have state level protections for half the country to have already passed their own version of the Equality Act 
protecting almost one more than actually one out of two Americans. So we are making history every day. This is what we do as transgender people. We achieve the impossible. We have done it before and we will do it again. It is just a matter of time, but that's why you got to call your Senator. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. Um, well, I, you know, we're, we're getting close to 9 PM here and I really want to leave some time for questions. Um, so I'm going to jump to those. We actually got a really, uh, and by the way, uh, for the folks on the call tonight, if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. If you'd like to remain anonymous, you can message me directly um, and I will read your question for you. Um, but we did get a question uh, just a couple moments ago from Gail. Uh, Gail said that um, they've been working in Florida with Sage uh, and um, they're really wanting to know, are certain states being targeted? Are, are there certain states that we want to uh, really invest in, in phone banking and text banking to? Um, I think, Sai, you probably have the best knowledge of that. Sure, absolutely. I first want to say thank you for working with doing phone banking and text banking because we know how, again, that that can be a little bit intimidating, but we ultimately know how much um, it, it, it definitely helps us, you know, get our constituents to call, you know, their, their senators and everything. So thank you for doing that. So some of those states that we are specifically kind of prioritizing, but we want to get all of our states right, but we have Maine, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Florida, as you mentioned. Indiana, Iowa, Wisconsin, Nebraska, Utah, and Alaska, I think are, are the main ones, yeah. And there's, is there a reason why we're, we're looking at those states? Um, or is it just because we know that uh, there's more of our community there that we, we can reach out to? Exactly that, exactly that, and, and just, just more we can reach out to, more work that we can do, getting those senators on our side, and that, you know, just, just more we can do in those areas. And we also want to make sure that we're flooding those offices with more calls than our opposition is, you know, so maybe those are, well, not maybe, but those are the states where we need to up our calls and make sure we're drowning out the opposition as well. Thank you so much. And I'd like to do a plug here that after you've called your own senators, <laughs> think about, do you know anybody in these states? So even if you live in, um, even if you don't live in one of these states, you might know someone who does. And you might live in one of these states, but still know other people who live in the other states. So don't limit yourself to just where you live, which is important. Think about, do you have family somewhere there? Do you have an, an old friend from school somewhere there? Do you have an old roommate who's moved on to one of those states? They are all constituents. They are all people in those states and those senators work for them, not the other way around. So think about who do you know in every single one of these places. Because they trust us, right? They trust you, you're your, their family, their friends. So they're gonna trust the things that you say. And if, you, if I tell my mama to call senators in Jackson, Mississippi, she will do it because she trusts, you know, my opinion and trusts the, the goal that I'm going for. That's right. Um, we got a really great question from Kay here. Um, Kay asks, how many Republican senators are currently supportive of the Equality Act? Um, are all the Democratic senators on board? Um, I'm going to leave it to Ames or Rodrigo. Who wants to take that one? Sure, I'm happy to do it. So um, all of the Democratic senators are on board, which is fantastic. Almost every single one of them is not only saying they're so supportive, but also is a co-sponsor of it. Nevertheless, they still need to hear from you because they need to know that this is important to their voters. There is a difference between being supportive of a bill and prioritizing a bill. There is a difference between having signed on as a co-sponsor and thinking, oh yeah, 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 sure. Um, and then never thinking twice about it again versus really hustling for it and making sure that you're gonna do everything you can to get it passed. So all the, senator, all, all the Democratic senators are on board, but they still need to hear from us. The opposition is calling them. So our side in support has to be calling them too. To the question about the Republicans, we are actively working on the Republicans. So uh, we need 10 of them to vote in favor of the Equality Act um, to not just get a bare majority, but actually override a filibuster too. That's the case for any piece of 
legislation that's at all contentious because, um, you know, our democracy is uh, still a work in progress. <laughs> We've still got some gigs to work out as a country, as a governing body. So anyway, we need 60 total votes. That means we need 10 Republicans. Um, and that's why these Republicans got to hear from us. There are some Republicans who support protections for transgender people. And we know that's true because number one, our day-to-day -day reality of a lot of us, we might be Republican. We might have family members who are Republican and still support transgender rights, right? Maybe just because they support us, but that's a way in. And all of this polling bears this out that more and more Republicans and independents are coming to support transgender people every day. And number two, we know it because of our work in the States. Like I mentioned before, half the country already has protections like this, and that includes states with Republican legislatures. So there is no reason that being a Republican should mean that they vote against the Equality Act, but they need to hear from their constituents. Those senators might be scared of public pushback. They might be scared of being attacked by the opposition if they vote our way. So we need to show them that they that we want them we people in their state want them to support the equality act thank you um well the chat is open uh we have time for maybe one or two more questions so if you have anything feel free to place it in the chat or message me directly um i will mention i placed earlier a link to our action center the ncte action center where you can find more resources um so if you want to check that, feel free to do so. Um, I noticed in the Q&A, we actually have um, a question from Jennifer. Um, Jennifer has two questions. Um, the first is, it seems obvious to me that part of the Anti-Equality Act Forces strategy is to wear down our LGB family by focusing on transgender people and marshaling opposition towards our inclusion in the act. At this point, is there any chance of trans fo transgender folks having any inclusion of our rights in the bill. Um, I think that means exclusion. So, so in like ENDA in 2007. Ames, do you wanna cover that one or Rodrigo? Well, I can start and then Ames, feel free to add on. So the good news is no, there's no risk of trans people being cut out of the Equality Act. Um, the debacle of ENDA in 2007 made that very, very clear. Uh, no one, neither in the LGBTQ movement nor the senators themselves um, are willing to pay the high political price of cutting transgender people out, which is good. That means we've done our job as a movement. We've done our job as advocates. Um, so now there's no threat of transgender people being cut out. You are right that, um, that this is a strategy by the opposition to try to kind of drive a wedge between transgender people and the rest of the LGBTQ umbrella. Um, so in general, we do need to mobilize our cisgender, our non-transgender LGB allies. We need to make sure if you've got cis LGB people in your life, talk with them about the Equality Act, make sure they're on board, make sure they understand the bill. Don't take their support for it for granted. Um, but thankfully, there's no risk of trans people being cut out of the bill. Are, we're secure in that sense. Great. And, and also, um, uh, Jennifer also asks, um, you know, she finds that a lot of people are surprised um, that LGBTQ people can be denied medical care um, and, and that this is still happening in our country. Um, so Jennifer asks, how can we really focus on that aspect of non-discrimination protections, recognizing that healthcare is something that a lot of people um, are united on, healthcare protections, being able to access healthcare, um, what are some of the really the talking points, the messaging that we may want to um, issue to our communities? Um, Sai, do you want to do you want to answer that one? Sure, absolutely. Um, and of course, folks can can input if they had some too. The first thing that kind of popped out of me as far as talk, talking point goes as a black trans person, barriers right? those barriers that we have to jump over and that we face even accessing. Um, affirming healthcare, even getting to affirming healthcare. A lot of us deal with so many socioeconomic issues, housing, employment, all of the things that we face the discrimination in that the equality will help alleviate from, uh, for us. And Rigo touched on this too, that once we have more safe working environments and, and safe access to working environments, that leads to insurance coverage. That leads to, to 
to even um, insurance plans and, and long time, long life planning and end of life planning, things that we don't talk about that trans people don't have the access to. A lot of trans people don't have access to end of life planning and, and wheels and to know what that looks like because for black trans women, the lifetime expectancy now is 32 years of age. So who is thinking about an end of life plan at the year at the age of 32? You know, so these are the kind of conversations that we need to have because that's some of the broader things is that the Equality Act is going to open up. It's going to relieve that discrimination in those public accommodations so that trans folks can now have access to affirming health care, which leads to affirming insurance, which leads to all other things, housing, jobs, all of those things. So the first thing to me that jumped out with that question is talking about the barriers that we face, even accessing this stuff and how the Equality Act will alleviate those barriers. Absolutely, and just to underscore that, uh, a part of that, I think it really goes to show the power of making this concrete, like Sai was saying earlier about making this understandable and digestible. It is very easy for legislation to just sound like legalese that doesn't have any bearing on your day-to-day -day life. You put in the chat, uh, you mentioned Tyra Hunter's experience that, that she passed away after um, being essentially refused care by EMTs. So yes, bringing up these specific stories, these specific anecdotes is really powerful. Um, and use, it's also really powerful to use examples beyond just employment. Um, employment is really important, um, but there's, in addition, all these other aspects of daily life that are also critical that haven't really been, that are not in the public consciousness as much yet. Um, so thank you for that question and thank you for all your advocacy. Um, good to see you, by the way. <laughs> I owe you a phone call. Um, but yeah, and make, make it tangible, make it impactful by giving those examples. That goes a long way. Thanks, Rodrigo. Um, we have one more question that I think we have time to answer, and this comes from Zion, who asks, how, if in any way, can universities support the work that we're doing? And I think really anyone can answer this, so um, whoever, whoever has, a, has an answer. I'll jump out there first, Sean. So I think the amazing thing that um, I, we know that this past legislative session, our youth have been downright attacked, right? But our youth are so like our, our, our college students, our middle school and high school students, they're so strong and resilient. They're, they're going to stand up and fight for themselves. But you know, definitely for me, I'm always asking places like that to add programming for LGBTQ plus students because there is a population there. Add those, you know, in the, in the corporate world, they call them VRG groups. I think they call them more like pride groups in university, university and things of that nature. And then once you make those groups, Come and do a phone banking session. Come and do a text banking session. Do a letter writing section, a, a, a session. You know, you can go on NCTE's website and you can do and go to our action alert page and send emails and letters to your senators. Do a postcard event. You know, that's how we get people activated. And trust me, our youth, our young folks are ready. They're ready to join the fight because they are resilient. And we do have to rely on them to kind of carry us through some of these things as well, because they're experiencing, especially our youth in this past legislative session, have experienced so much hurt and so much denial. They are ready to stand up and fight. So we're just giving them ways to be a part of the movement. Absolutely. And add, adding a little bit more there, also get creative about all of the different states that a student can lay claim to. If this is a university where a lot of students are coming from multiple places, then think about, okay, where is the school situated? Who are those senators? And then think about each student who's showing up. Where are they from? Because it might be a different state. You don't know. You don't want to make assumptions. And if they are from a different state, then they can call that senator too, right? And they have networks in other places. So get creative about all the different states that you can, that you and your students can lay claim to, so to speak. That really broadens the reach. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Well, um, we're at eight fifty-seven, and um, you know, I want to wrap things up tonight, but I just want to say. A big thank you to everyone on the call tonight for participating, um, for providing such awesome questions. Um, it really was just such a great dialogue. And 
um, you know, I've placed in the chat a link to the NCTE Action Center. Um, so feel free to visit the Action Center. There's a bunch of information and resources on how you can stay more involved. Um, but yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining tonight. There will be recording of the webinar um, published to YouTube in the coming days. So feel free to share that uh, with your network um, and those who couldn't attend tonight. Um, and everyone have a great rest of your week. And we'll see you all soon. Bye. Yeah, thank you all so much for donating and for joining. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Have a good night.